Upwork still stands. If you feel you need the uh, translation, please feel free to, to take uh, the things from there. And also the offer for the seats and the stickers also stands as well. Okay, um, the actual reason that this event is organized is because uh, Shoshin Theatre Association uh, was part of a, a European project, an Erasmus Plus funded uh, project, which is called RIOTE. This is an acronym which stands for Rural Inclusive Outdoor Theatre Education. This was the title of the project. What the project was about is uh, eight partners from different countries, eight organizations came together uh, and they exchanged workshops, so-called joint staff trainings, where you could, you could learn from the experiences of the other partners and each organization would host one such training in their own uh, country. Then the second thing was to make a performance with a, a, a group of locals in a village, so in a rural area, preferably outdoors. So our task was to find, and the task of each partner was to find a, a local community that they could work with, to deliver a series of workshops to this community, to the, to the participants that were willing to take part in this action, and then at the, at the end, to make a performance with them, with the par participants, so that the locals would be the actors in the performance. But what was important is that this performance was not going to be something already written. We were not going to put on a play. We were going to approach it from the key word, the myth. That's why this trend of the project was, uh, had the title, The Myth Behind uh, the Community. Um, and uh, then, based on these experiences, we, uh, the partners uh, um, uh, did this output, which is a PDF, it's a digital book, which can be downloaded uh, from the website of the project, uh, which is riote.org but also from the websites of the participating organizations. So uh, Shoshin will put it on our own website. What you can see here now is the English version, but um, we also have a Romanian version and the Hungarian version. These are not online yet, uh, but they will get online uh, in what remains from this month of September. So by the end of the month, we should have uh, all, the, all the versions. So this output is The Myth Behind the Community, an anthology of theatrical experiences in rural areas. And as the subtitle suggests, we are uh, dealing with a collection of texts written by all the partners and divided into chapters, of which we have four. So we have participatory theater in rural areas, theater as a tool for inter intercultural dialogue, interpretation skills development and street theater techniques, and caravans as a main concept for rural touring and connecting uh, communities, plus an introduction and closing thoughts. Um, going to the introduction a little bit, starting off from what our colleague Marco Luciano from Teatro Nucleo wrote, I would like to read aloud the very first paragraph. You can also see it there, of course. Theater is based on citizenship. As Stefano Rodotta said, theater is the polis. In its main characteristics, it has the function of collecting the legacy of ritual, of celebration, of mythology, through which the community represents itself, narrates itself, and celebrates itself in its social dramas and ideals. Theater and educational processes meet in the relational, social, and communitarian dimension, where cognitive, emotional, and physical aspects are integrated, where we can recognize the multiple dimensions of the individual's development, and where knowledge is intertwined with feeling, creation, and aesthetics. 
So, um, as I said, uh, this, this output is largely based on the experiences of the partners um, through, the, through the specter of, of uh, the, the four chapters that we have. Um, when I talk about myth, it's not, for instance, one of the Hungarian partners, one of the partners from Hungary, Sinu, they work with their uh, local group, local community, on an actual myth, a mythological tale of uh, Janus Pifrontes. But, for instance, us in Mera, we work on, on local myths, so myths of origin from Mera, local legends, intertwined with personal history of the participants, their personal memories and uh, themes that are important for them from their own uh, community, family and life. And you can mention this in the, in the very first uh, panel. So, um, as Marco Luciano points out a little bit later in the introduction, the word myth should not be understood simply as mythology, epic, fantastic tale but rather in its purest meaning, that of war, tale, or discourse. The community that precisely narrates, questions and responds, generates the stories that ground and define its social system, expressing a precise pace in the historical development of human communication. They allow fears and beliefs, hopes, and socio-economic conditions to emerge in the form of symbols. Through narration, be it oral, musical, or physical, communities recognize and preserve themselves. So this output then details the different approaches taken by the partners uh, and gives uh, a sort of a collection of strategies. Each partner in their respective chapter details the way that they approached their own community. Uh, an input from Mark Heliar uh, from the UK, uh, detailing the work that they, they did in a small town uh, in Somerset, um, where they were doing it, what their aspirations were, what their artistic aspirations were, what were the expectations of the community uh, itself, um, how they did it, uh, what was planned and what was the difference between what was initially planned and the way it played out. So, uh, as he has here, what worked well and what worked less well. Um, and then we have uh, Shoshin's experiences in rural areas doing participatory theater. So again, detailing the way that we would approach a local community and detailing uh, the, uh, the idea and concept of uh, the barter, which is uh, a cultural exchange between locals and the artists that visit them. So in the idea of the barter, it's not just that the locals are watching a show, it's they are taking part in it with input from their own culture, which can be a song, a poem, a tale, or just uh, some kind of work with the hand, a showing a profession, or showing a tractor, or a cow, as part of your local culture. So, we try to detail this, as well as the work that we did last year in uh, Mera, how we, were, how we were working towards reaching a group cohesion in a group where we had the oldest participant was 77, and the youngest was four. So, uh, how, how to bridge this? How to arrive, how to try and arrive in a situation where there is no hierarchy between the oldest and the, the, the smallest one in age. A situation where, you can, where horizontal structures can play out, where there is equality and everybody from the smallest little girl to the most elderly can have the freedom to, to express themselves and, and put their input into what they are doing together. Um, so this is basically detailing uh, our experience. Then in the second chapter, um, our partners from Slovenia and from France, they go more into intercultural aspects. So a lot of their work is dealing with, for instance in France, uh, working with immigrants and local community. 
So how to make a theater project where where you take where you take immigrants and you take the local people and try to find again the bridge between them, uh, how to connect them. Uh, again, you can you have a lot of descriptions, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of tactics, concrete strategies, concrete exercises employed. Um, for instance, table theater is a practice run by Kudlyud, uh, our Slovenian partner, um, which is that you take a table, you, you go to a certain community and you make interviews with them about the problems of their community. It can be people who are living in one apartment block. For instance, what problems do they face in their normal interactions and life uh, in that place? And then you take these interviews, you devise a very simple interaction, theater, but not so, not so complicated, not so complex. And you invite these people, but usually it would be five or ten people. It can be 40, it can be 50 but it works best with, for instance, 10 people. And they sit around the table, they watch the, the play, the drama that plays out, which was built on the interviews made with them, and then they enter into a discussion about what they saw, about how they understand all this, and what their input would be, and so on. So this is a very uh, uh, small-scale thing, but extremely powerful, uh, uh, precisely because it works with not so many people, so the effect can be much stronger. Um, this the, the partners in France I already uh, mentioned. And then in this uh, third chapter, there are, uh, the, the focus is more on street, street theater, so we have the input from our Hungarian partner, the German uh, partner. We have also, again, uh, a lot of, uh, especially in the, in the German uh, uh, part, a lot of uh, exercises, concrete exercises that describe and that can be taken and used. And then in the fourth chapter, as I said, is this idea of the caravan, as we discussed in, in, the, in the previous panel. It, you take one performance to one place, but it works the best if you take one performance to different, uh, different places. So this book is sort of a, I think, a practical guide, a hands-on guide, which can be helpful to students or artists or people who, who would like to work uh, in, the, in, in the field of uh, engaging communities uh, in cultural practice. Um, as I said, for now it's a digital book, so it's a, it's a PDF, uh, but uh, we do have plans to, to print the Romanian and the Hungarian versions. For now, please feel free to download it, and please feel free to, to share it with anyone who you know that it could be helpful to them. Okay, um, and then just very briefly about the other input, uh, the other output, sorry. Uh, my input about the output uh, is, this is about, so within this project we received some, some things that would measure what is called HRV, heart rate variability, which is the little, very little difference in time between two heartbeats. Normally we do not sense that there is a difference, but there is a little fluctuation. This is a relatively new thing in science, and from these fluctuations in your heart rate variability, they can give you a lot of uh, clues about uh, how stressed you are, about uh, how fit you are, about uh, um, how well you rest, and so on. So, for instance, I'm just going to cut to, to one. So this is, and we had the opportunity to test this. Um, and then you have this uh, nice chart. So here we were all uh, writing a little journal, what we are doing, family life, 45 minutes, eating, 60 minutes, so on. And then, from the measurements, we can see our uh, stress.
stress levels. So for the, the red is not, the red is stress. So we can see here that the person who was wearing this had a very, very stressful day in which, in, in which he had just very, very short moments of, uh, of uh, not stress, of, of uh, recovery. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of uh, stressful uh, experiences. And this was the most, 15 minutes with the strongest stress reactions. And if you can see here, this is a meeting which lasted, which lasted 15 minutes. <laughs> so, um, we, we tried this on and it was, this shit is just, then you, you look at it and you're like, oh no, God. Um, um, we also tried these uh, with the participants that we worked with. And there was another, um, gadget, which is called the Polar. And this one doesn't measure just the individual, but it can measure, measure the collective. So we put it on all the actors that participated, but also during the performance where we had audience, we put it also on members of the audience. And then this allows you, and I will just show you the, a few charts. This is, for instance, uh, this is too complicated. <laughs> So this, for instance, this line is the workshop leader. You can see that at the, at the, at the whole time he was relatively stable. The situation was he was giving instructions to the participants, but he was not engaged in it himself, physically. He was just watching, which allowed him to be relatively stable. And you can see the participants, uh, heart rate changing while they were doing the exercises. So, uh, you can see that kind of like the same thing is happening to uh, most of the people at the same time. Of course, this is connected here. Probably there was an exercise which involved more uh, physical activity. But uh, uh, at the same time, it allows for uh, synchronicity in the, in the team to develop. And then... Uh, Nicolette, Nicolette. Okay. And here is another trainer. Uh, she was doing the exercises together with the party. Or maybe he, I don't know. He or she. You can see the name. He or she was doing the. the and Iker was doing the exercises together with the participants. So you can see, as opposed to the previous example, uh, uh, she is also fluctuating together with the group and a little bit above it. <laughs> so, uh, I am not an expert of these charts, um, uh, but our colleague from, uh, from Utsasat, which is a, one of the Hungarian organizations present in this uh, project, he was the one who led this part of the, of the project, this uh, research, and he was the one who wrote this output, the ninth sense. This is also being finished and translated, so hopefully we will have it by the end of the month. And this also can offer uh, insight into what exactly is happening in physiological terms in the individual and in groups in the act of theater. Which can also be helpful, I think, for artists and, and of course professionals from other fields as well uh, who are interested in this. Okay, this is the end of my part. Thank you very much for, for, for being here. download the books. <laughs>
me, uh, sort of a highlight. Um, I introduce you to Sue Gill and John Fox from uh, Ten Good Guides and uh, formerly uh, Welfare State International. I am very happy, and in the, in the name of the whole team, I can say that we are very happy and thankful that you accepted our invitation and that you came here and that you will uh, give this little talk about your, your activity. And also there is a short film and I think some surprises as well uh, from New York. All the, all the, all the birds will start falling down the um, uh, Just from an organizational perspective, I would like to kindly ask you at the end, if you still haven't uh, uh, completed this uh, participants list, my colleague Julia uh, will come around and try to ask people, have you completed? Uh, she will try to do this. Uh, if you haven't completed, please try to, to, to be helpful with her. Also, I repeat our invitation uh, to take these gifts, and I would like to give the word to Well, hello, thank you. Um, just to say before we start, I'd like to give some thanks because we've been beautifully, wonderfully treated here by a lot of people. Chongo, Kolo, Holly, and Eunice, and about 12 volunteers who have been working their socks off all the time to help us. And I'm not going to read out all the names because I won't remember them, but there are a lot of volunteers and a massive amount of help from, from the people here. We started off this morning with a little workshop, and this is the, the, the collapsing bird syndrome. We also produced a piece of epic theatre. It was a unique uh, pr production, uh, certainly a world premiere, uh, of the relationship between a vacuum cleaner a hen and a knife and fork. Truly epic. Those of you who are here were said it was epic. We have one absolute <laughs> dream. Uh, there we go. So, um, over to you. And we also had a song. Uh, we learnt it in about four minutes this morning. The words are, because we're going to sing it two or three times, it's a very short song, and if you felt comfortable, you are welcome to do it. Oh, hello, you're sitting. So, the words are, my poor bird, take thy flight high above the sorrows of this dark.
should have rather remained in that. And, uh, just to say that the words, the words that have been coming up today, uh, over and over again, are community, participation, connection, dialogue, stories, and then authority and money. We're going to talk about everything except authority and money. In 1968, way before half of you were even born, we started creating our first street theatre and our manifesto read, we're making an entertainment, an alternative, and a way of life. In 2022, 54 years later, our aims are surprisingly similar, although a way of life is taking priority. It's a journey of many endings and new beginnings. John Fox and I started Welfare State International, known as WSI, with others in 1968. The company achieved a worldwide reputation for creating site-specific theatre, fire shows, lantern parades, installations, and participatory art. We archived WSI in 2006, long story, and started Dead Good Guys, our new smaller company. Whilst we will reference a little of our own events, we will concentrate mainly on our work with communities in and around Ulverston in Cumbria, that's the Lake District, North West England. Just to say, I'm not sure the trigger's working. Is it, it, should it be working now or is it coming on later? Yeah. No, I know, but there was a couple of slides. But... Yeah. I'll go to it. I'll, I'll stop reading next week. We're going to show you a film at the moment, uh, which was about our last show. It was called Long Line, the Carnival Opera. Now, this show lasted three hours and it was performed four times in a circus tent in snow in March 2006. It was prepared and researched over three years, building trust and skills, as you all know, within a community network takes time and patience, and multi-skilled artists who listen and who are happy to work with different generations. Over three, hang on, over three years, we researched the history and the ecology of Morecambe Bay, talked to many people, produced exhibitions, a song cycle, a preview theatre piece in a cockpit arena in Lantern House, which is a building we got with a lottery funding, which we'll show you at the end. And we developed a whole young people's theatre ensemble, and we published a photograph text book of Bay characters and their stories. So here is the film. <laughs> Playing snakes and ladders, and all the ladders have gone away. The snow was unexpected. When uh, was, we suggested we were doing a gig in March, people said, oh, you know, it'd be too cold. And I thought, oh, it'd be fine, you can heat a surface tent, but you'll never get any snow around here in March if you get the first snow for 30 years around here. It's been a few problems. Yeah. First, the generator went, so we lost all electric in the tent, and it was snowed all the games, so we had no one for keeping the cars to. But that's fine, because. Um, we have the advice. We we try to kind of help out as much as we can. Do a lot of rigging and well, 
Try not to get that mucky, but well, you know, it's not working. Basically, there were, there were musicians in there who were playing this way to the crowd of theatre, but in the meantime, you, were, you put that side back in the city then. Okay. You wouldn't? Yeah. And um, we need to prepare for that, and then we're going to do a run through the show, and then the show will put the fire out. Really, we're going to put that side, and then we're going to close it up again. So we can open the whole side. You wouldn't? Okay. Yeah. And I'll just put a bit of an overlap on I'll do a drawing for you briefly. And it, it went on and on like that. We then had a quagmire on site, so we had to do have a ton of gravel delivered in order to stop the flooding. Then we had to build uh, drains and we had to put pumps in and so on. <laughs> That's well for state, boy. Yeah. Well for state. We need to. Um, I think it was fine you doing the mass, but do it very formally, very like you know. Um, a bit of a priest, you know, you're doing really. Alright, so if you then crouch down, okay, and, and Ruben is ready behind his puppet to come forward. So now let's try getting the. Now, can we get the. Um, I was looking for the dragon's going at this point. We're now based on the new script, from the 13 on the old script. Why don't we go. Um, the Alamia, five part Alamia. Dials of what's dead for us uh, uh, <laughs> when the sea swells. Well, yeah, and they're not going to the sing like those anyway. And they're not going to go over the choir singing when the sea swells. Oh, are, are you saying sing? you do want like those? Yes. Well, no, what I'm asking is are you going to put the film on? No, I think that's going to be confusing. <laughs> keep it clear. Okay. Keep it clear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right, so we then go into the village, uh, yeah. uh, bringing down the a bit of, I was going to write a poem or a speech as well. And again, some kind of sense of how long that lasts. Or... He's not smiling for that. He'll just go round and round and round. Do 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 We'll have to time that with the action. Yeah. I just need to know the end. The running order of the show is here. Right, please take it into consideration. I will cue you in plenty of time. Tomorrow, I think for our own state of mind, I think it would be really, really good if you guys could make it here for 6.15. Tomorrow is the opening night. If you could make it here for 6.15 tomorrow night, that would be brilliant to go through some of the bits we have to done. I will see you tomorrow. Clear the space quietly. Thank you. It's an ecological fable. It's a warning, it's a prophecy about um, the history of the bay, both in the deep past and the present and the future. I was expecting to be moved, but I'm uh, pleasantly surprised that I, I, what I'm moved by, as I say, uh, yeah, I was ready to be moved, but uh, yeah, just uh, full of surprises ever. Full of surprises ever. I'm enjoying it very much. Yeah, it's sort of a combination of all the things that Welfare State have done through the years and um, coming together. Uh, it's a little bit scary. <laughs> I'm just like a black or kid everybody getting involved. Yeah, yeah. It's like a black or kid everybody getting involved. Particularly now, people you know, people are just meeting in the street afterwards. That, as we're part of the production here, then you see them behind the butcher's shop or in the queue at Aston. Fantastic. It's really good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Fools come off the stage, I was sitting next to a small girl, she was about three years old, and she burst into spontaneous applause, which made me cry. Um, it was a very moving performance, the whole thing. Well done, well first day. about a way of um, connecting people through their, their hands and their hearts and their, and their needs in, in a way that uh, uh, is really important to maintain. So I think a lot of what we live in is a, is a, a kind of fake, well, it's a fake democracy, but it's also a fake um, reality. People are persuaded that things are real. And when you actually examine them, they're, they're, they're fantasy, they're mad, they're really trying to or, or um, the hypocrisy of an arms dealer that you get where you know, the, the story goes from our prime minister that if we don't sell arms, somebody else will. But, I mean, but it's, it's wicked and immoral. <laughs> state of uh, extreme apathy and fear by manipulation through, um, say, terrorism or through mortgages or through propaganda, um, so that they're not able to be free to connect with their neighbours to make things in a more home neighbourhood.
of the difficulties, which were enormous, was where a sense of everybody holding on to this mess, you know, like 200 people hanging on to it. There was a big egg in there. You know, if you got it wrong, if you threw it in the air or it fell to the edge, it would be a total disaster. So by all those people focusing, concentrating, with great uh, dedication, commitment and, and, and generosity, they kept the egg fine, it didn't fall off the egg. And I think that's a kind of political statement. It's perfectly possible to do it, and it doesn't happen often enough, uh, because people are, are divided and ruled by uh, fear and greed.
line is you'll never find a drug in, the, in a man-made zoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the review by Lynn Gardner of The Guardian newspaper says all we'd hope for. Where do we come from? Where are we going? How does landscape shape us and how do we shape landscape? How can we learn from the past to transform our futures? Just some of the questions raised by Longline, the last ever show to be produced by Welfare State International, which will cease to be after 38 years of creating performances, pageants, rituals, and celebrations. Like all Welfare State's work, Longline is different from most theater. It's about people, not product. It's full of colors, acrobats and junk puppets. It's empty of polish and ego. It's loud with the sound of brass bands and massed choirs, and soft with whispered memory, as if it's trying to uncover a collective, unconscious, buried layer beneath layers of sand and rock. It comes from the community and speaks directly to it, drawing on the geological and social history of the area surrounding Morecambe Bay from millions of years ago to trident submarines and globalization. Because it is so specific, it has a claim to be universal. It's inclusive in every way. This show is alive with ghosts, the 19th century mill children left to drown in the quicksands, the Chinese cockle pickers sent out in darkness by gang masters who lost their lives in the incoming tide, Gladys, the woman who tried to save Morgan Pier and who lost it, watching it blaze, taffeta pink, like her own ruined childhood dress. Long line is about what we've all lost, and in its quietly moving, highly ritualized second half, about how we might retrieve it. Ragged round the edges, chaotic, unfinished, and untamed, all the wobbly bits are in plain view. But it's so full of invention and puppetry, it makes the Lion King, that London West End show, look cheap and dowdy. Go to Longline, make sure you take your warm vest, your boots, and your heart. Overstoke is an old market town, population 14,000, located on the western edge of Morecambe Bay. The town used to depend on fishing for shellfish, farming, and water-powered mills, but in the 20th century it changed to chemical and high-tech industries, many linked to armaments, nuclear power, and trident submarines. The main source of employment now, nine miles away in Cairo and In 1978, we stopped our nomadic existence, touring with our circus tent and convoy of ten caravans, and our family settled in a house in Overston. The town was in decline with 44 empty shops and a miserable atmosphere. Now it is vibrant, a trendy place to live, proclaiming itself the festival's town. Over recent decades, we and the arts have played a big part in its cultural revival. Our clowning outdoor events, such as dancing traffic cones, would deride multiple ever-changing roadworks. We started flag fortnights with locally designed handmade silk flags to fly above shop fronts for two weeks in May. New flags are still made year by year. Walking along the cobbled street, it is like walking inside a Matisse painting. Family flags were popular, far popular, flying above people's homes. Designed by school children, they celebrate the work of their parents. I'm proud my dad is a firefighter, and I'm proud that my mum is an ambulance driver. Comic street theater, devised and rehearsed in public workshops, frequently with novice performers, as included wheelbarrow formation dancing, inspired by vegetable shows, traditional and still popular in the local culture. Participants become giant carrots and parsnips. Our early role in the 1980s was to initiate events 
support and hand over to the community to volunteers when it felt the right time. Then step back. Sue and I both play saxophones in Blast Furness, Furness being the name of the location as opposed to Blast Furness, the name of a, of a, a steel um, uh, kiln. A street band that has been going for 20 years, which always gets a gig at local festivals and shows. WSI was invited to an international theatre festival. In 1982, way up in the north of Japan, where we made a version of King Lear on a mountainside. We were lucky enough to experience an extraordinary Shinto lantern parade as we travelled after the festival. Returning to, uh, to Ulverston, we invented and started Ulverston's lantern parade a year later. We experimented with willow sticks to make frameworks, wet strength tissue paper glued over, and lit by candles inside. This worked perfectly. From small beginnings, this festival has grown and spread worldwide. In August and every September, we close the streets to traffic for one night, as four parades, four rivers of light, led by four bands, flow from all quarters of the town. The theme is different every year. Hundreds of lanterns are constructed, and thousands of residents and many visitors congregate for an annual moment of belonging and excess. It's only in aid of itself, entirely voluntary, homemade, although with the inherent skill of local engineers in the family, multi-generational, and a seasonal autumnal rite of passage to celebrate family and friends and belonging before the dark days of winter, a classic model of community art. Now, I digress now. At, at this time in the UK, this actual week, actually today, no, this actual week, sorry, thousands of events are being cancelled, sports events, cultural events, in line with the death of the Queen. The Lantern Parade team in Alveston agonised over what to do and decided to go ahead, not to cancel, as this moment brings people together and will offer a focus and a moment to be together a local artist has been commissioned to make a unique lantern in the shape of a royal crown, which will lead to one of the parades. So, at this actual time tonight, families will be coming out of their front doors with their children, with their lanterns, to go to their start points. The bands will be warming up, that bus first band. So, for the last 34 years, John and I have never missed it. So tonight, because we wanted to be here, we are missing it at the year 35. So, <laughs> so, with that quick run through of that work, an entertainment, as we said earlier, an alternative, a way of life? Yes. From the top of a nearby hill, a monumental lighthouse looms over Ulverston. It is a memorial to Sir John Barrow, an 18th century imperialist Lord of the Admiralty, who was born here. An important principle of community art is to use the local themes, so the lighthouse turns up in various guises. <laughs> Probably Sir John Barrow saying he can't be having these, this nonsense and all of a sudden you know, he's going to recruit imperialist soldiers and stop them. <laughs> so, um, an important principle of community arts is to make sure your birds don't fall over. And um, especially, of course, when you're marking something like the Millennium 2000. Now, community art, or quote, socially engaged arts in the current jargon, should be strong original, poetic, surprising, engaging, and necessary, not surrogate social work or sentimental, jingoistic reinforcements. For the millennium, we had to be very wary of being used for the wrong political reasons, but at least we've persuaded hundreds of people 
to walk up Lighthouse Hill, some for the first time in their lives, to see the longest flag in the world and experience how local skilled mountain climbers, costumed as six St. John Barriers, abseiling on ropes from the top of the monument. Once upon a time, WSI toured to many countries with many shows. We lived collectively, mostly pair bonded, in a mobile village of caravans. In the 1970s, we thought more theatre troops would follow, but few did. In working and living together, we discovered occasional ceremonies to mark milestones in our lives. Some of this legacy has since become mainstream and we'll return to that topic a little later. We educated all the company's young children ourselves on the road in a whirlwind of creative discovery, hands-on learning, practical art making, and working to earn a living. It was successful. These young people, well, some of them are in their 50s already, are now out in the professional world as artists, musicians, a legal aid lawyer, an environmental project leader, an animator, fashion designer, and a TV production manager. Our big spectacles, such as theatrically setting fire to a replica of the Houses of Parliament for an audience of 12,000, were challenging. So was raising the Titanic in an international London Theatre Festival. For 10 days, each evening, on a dockside in Limehouse, in a three-hour carnival performance for a 300-seated audience, we demonstrated political links between the class-ridden disaster of the Titanic, Margaret Thatcher's capitalism, the Falklands War, and the gentrification of the very dockside we were working on with its expensive new apartments where local people were now excluded and where as we were working and living in our tents. Such powerful... Yeah. Yeah. There's just say a little bit about these slides. This is from the we used containers, which is one of the reasons the dock was changing from the old shipping harbour. And uh, we used the containers to use them like a doll's house and slice through. So the image you see here is of the, the stokers underneath lighting the fires and the rich people up above having a fancy dress party. The ice giants the iceberg intrudes. And there's a question at the end of essentially the children, why did you allow the Titanic to sink? The Titanic, of course, being in our case, an allegory for the political situation that we were in. So there was a challenging um, question. And then the sharks on the dockside come looming up at the end of the particular um, event. So, such powerful site-specific theatre received very good view, reviews, and we had a reputation, and we were getting grants. But, but, we travelled, we camped, created something new, and performed, then we left. Memories and rumours were established and enjoyed, but what remained? Radical as they were, these shows were still products entertainment to be enjoyed and consumed. We were looking for something more satisfying, more long-term and sustainable for ourselves and for the communities we connected with. So we abandoned the Wednesday and settled in Ulverston. In 1983, we also began a seven-year residency in Barrow in Furness, where the town fills our nation's nuclear submarines. A huge challenge for our anti-war politics. In all the years, we never accepted funding from some of the multi-billion pound company BAE systems, but we did constantly connect 
for the individuals who make up the workforce in the shipyard, as it is always referred to. So in 1983, Barrow had strong amateur theatre and music societies taking classic well-known plays, light operas and musicals off the shelf, but no contemporary arts policy and no locally created new original work. We started the ball rolling with a punk film casting performers from the Am I not We started the ball rolling with a punk film casting performers from the community based on Shakespeare's King Lear and written by radical poet Adrian Mitchell. He reversed the name from King Lear to King Real, King Real and the Hoodlums was a Mad Max provocation which kept a lot of adolescents off the streets because we started serving breakfast on site at 8 o'clock in the morning to get them the cows to turn up and their mothers just sent them out and <coughs> So we'll feed you, go down here, off the streets. And, it's, and it starred a mad king in a nuclear submarine. It caused a furor. So, to placate critics, in 1987, we decided to design an an ingratiating sonnet lumiere to mark the centennial of Barrow Town Hall, featuring Queen Victoria, there she is on the poster. She'd been invited, but she failed to attend in 1887, so we thought it was time she should visit on her elephant gun carriage. So that's the Town Hall. This parade is of the refuse collectors who turned out on the Sunday and had decorated their refuse carts. We had to give a few lots of pound notes to get them there, but they came. Oh, yes. This is Queen Victoria, you see, on the top of her gun carriage, her, her elephant gun carriage. And that's a pair of the boobies flying on the back of the, of, of the carriage. Right. Um, that's the B because the coat of arms of the barrow is a B and an arrow. Right. Very simple. Very simple. We called this event Tattoo Day, and we threw at it production values the like of which no one in Barrow had ever seen before, including a huge daylight pyrotechnic display from the top of the town. Oh, and there's the Nickers flying. Okay, it's you. A number of our key artists chose to live in Barrow. This commitment was crucial and helped us to initiate a choir, theatre workshops, writing workshops, a carnival parade band, cabaret evenings in pubs and poetry performances. The work rose to a climax in 1990 with a tapestry of shipyard tales presented over 10 days, mainly in the civic theatre with the proscenium stage, because that's the council that built and wanted us to use. And it was in the theatre that that theatre piece we did a number of, sorry, in that theatre we did a number of pieces, but some pieces were outside. The tapestry contained 11 original theatre shows, 10 entirely devised and performed by local people, and genres included sitcoms, a Brexit documentary, a children's opera, <coughs> The Shadow Factory, a song cycle about working in a wire factory, a street play with mummers, a full scale pantomime, and Lord Dynamite. It was tricky to say things too critical and too obviously critical of BAE systems, so we did it through Lord Alfred Nobel, Lord Dynamite as we called him, because he kept saying the biggest stick of dynamite will be will stop the war, and of course he made his fortune in, with dynamite and then tried to buy his way out with the peace prize. So it, it was appropriate to treat uh, Lord Dynamite, Alfred Nobel, as a symbolic one. Uh, character in the, in the context. A, a recurring feature also featured a greedy cuckoo who was invading the nests of innocent birds, while a mad scientist built a wall to stop the cuckoo leaving, claiming this will keep the summer in forever. Our leading gift was the Golden Submarine, a once-off extravaganza performed once on a rainy evening in the grounds of an ancient abbey for 3,000 spectators. After a carnival overture of dancers costumed as the streets of terrace houses, 
On came fantasy cars hurtling round the arena, which had been made and driven by shipyard welders who had taken their annual holidays so they could be involved. Next, here you see it, Lord Shelvent, the motorized capitalist ogre with detachable blood-stained hands, instructs the Tower of Aristocrats to, build, to launch a submarine. Too drunk to aim straight, they miss the submarine and launch the huge submarine sheds instead, which move aside to reveal a monstrous cuckoo inside, maintaining the eternal summer and the golden fleece for a barrow based on armament fields. Chaos ensues until a fussy of female cleaners with a giant vacuum cleaner built on a car overcome Lord Shelvent and bring and bring the show to an end with the unique covering of the three people. Oh, no. Okay, no, okay there's, well, it's missing. There was a slide there of the, um, the cleaners from the factory with massive three pin floats dancing across with electric wires turning around and doing the early invention of a crazy Danny Mumming dance, a victory dance over Lord Shelby. Now, you've seen the film. I just mentioned it again because I haven't mentioned that it was made by Wojtan Tursky. You get, can get it on, um, on YouTube. You can also find it. Our, our own website has been somewhat refurbished, but if you look on the, the media page, you can, you can find the film there. Come on, you've got to put a Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. In 1990, we left Barrow, leaving their art scene to grow with its own coterie of performers poets, musicians, the carnival band, and a young theatre company. Since then, filmmakers, sound artists, community art workshops, and a gallery have been established, and the town has an arts programme. Our main focus became Ulverston again. Here, we helped maintain the momentum of the festivals we had started, particularly with the complex lantern parades. And in 1997, we were awarded a 1.6 million of National Arts Lottery money to refurbish the old school we had bought chiefly a few years before. We transformed it into Lantern House, the National Centre for Celebratory Arts, opening in 1999 with accommodation for artists, many performances and exhibition spaces, with a programme of summer schools to train musicians, choir leaders and secular ceremonies. 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 This lottery award extended the life of Welcome State uh, for nearly a decade. Um, and this is the Morecambe Bay site where we told you the story of Longline and the films we made, which was the last performance show we did there before we archived the company in 20, 2006. So we said we'd return to uh, the rites of passage thing briefly. We'll approach at the end, and I think we might be coming in on time. And the night of bread will be moving on now. I can sense it. Devising new ceremonies for secular rites of passage, as in, there are many people we meet who are not members of any organised church, but still have a need for a spiritual life and wish to mark milestones in their lives with dignity, with meaning, and in a distinctive way. So we mentioned earlier when we were on the road, it was appropriate on occasion to mark certain personal milestones, such as naming the babies as they came along, betrothals, significant birthdays, or funerals. Such events, which we initially kept under the radar, they were never part of our public programme, gradually became more regular, and we found ourselves facilitating ceremonies with and for a wider public. Um, we, so we had an exhibition and we commissioned artists. There is no one in that coffin. It's a cardboard coffin from Switzerland. And we commissioned Caroline Menish to paint it for a lover of the sea. And to demonstrate you don't have to hire that expensive black purse. You can put it in the back of your own, your own car. <laughs> this is very interesting. This, a woman with her own diagnosis of her terminal illness came to see us. She'd read the funerals book that we, that we wrote, and she wanted to think about something distinctive for her own funeral. She was the, the captain of the ladies' golf team in her village, and also 
as she had a particular view that she longed for every night as she drove home from work. Go on. Go on. Oh, oh we haven't got it, that one. And so that coffin was painted by another artist, and as it was carried into the village church, nobody had seen it before, but they knew this woman, she was very popular. There was applause in the church, but she got it in one. That said everything about the tribute to her life. We've also had um, uh, oh, that's a child's coffin, um, very small. This is Wishbone House. Uh, we got a commission, um, and this was de designed by Duncan Copley, and uh, constructed a ceremony space. So in that space, we've held baby names.